You know what the very, very best stories are. Those that hook you right from the start and keep you on tender hooks right the way to the very end. You don't quite know what's happening, but you think you can have a guess, and then exactly what you were thinking turns out to be completely wrong. Well, tonight's story is just one of those. A fantastic, brilliant submission to Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so you could share your stories with me and I could read them all for you. And it's stories like this that make it all worth it, I can tell you. Well, my dear friends, I think you all deserve to sit back and relax once again with your favourite drink. And listen. This isn't my story. Or rather, to clarify, this is not a story about me. This is a story about a man named Max. The person who told me it swears it's a true story. I leave those judgments up to you. Max was 36 years old and what you would call a drifter. Not in the sense that he was homeless, but rather in the sense that he drifted through life. From job to job, from town to town, and from one life goal to another. He was a man with no real follow-through. He'd become fascinated with something for a while, or would come up with a life plan for a little bit, and then, soon enough, he was already bored with it and come up with another that he decided was better. None of these things made Max a bad person, of course. Max was a decent guy. He wouldn't lend him money, but otherwise, he was ordinary enough. Things would change for Max when he came to New York. I won't give the real name of where he rented the apartments, not the building or the streets. All you really need to know is that the building had a very impressive exterior, and that once you stepped through the doors, you found yourself in what resembled a hotel lobby with a large, wide staircase that looked like it had been transplanted into this building from another, far more expensive and well-maintained one. But despite this extravagant initial impression, Max soon learned that the building was, as the Brits might say, fur coat and no knickers. Or, to put it another way, the actual apartment was a dump. Max listened to the landlady as she sung the praises of what to him looked like a cheap and badly maintained dive, with little to recommend it save for the fact it had working water and power, and didn't seem to have any rats or cockroaches also making their home there. But Max, at this point in his life, was someone who didn't like to cause offence or hurt anyone's feelings needlessly. So, he listened and smiled and nodded, as he walked around the apartment and then led back out. He assured Amy, the landlady, that he really did think that it was a swell place to live and that he would give serious thought to renting here. His plan was to leave and then move on and find himself somewhere better to live that was still within his budget. And if he hadn't turned around as they walked back down the stairs, he probably would have. If he hadn't turned around, the rest of his life might have been so much happier. It would, at the very least, have been very different. But he did. And that's when he saw it. Upon the wall was a colossal framed photograph. He didn't understand how he'd missed it when he climbed up those stairs. It seemed impossible that he'd failed to even passingly take notice of his presence there. But he saw it now. He saw her. The photograph was of a woman. She was clad in a long and expensive looking dress, the kind you'd expect to see an actress wearing at a red carpet event, or a fashion model to strut down a runway wearing. The dress seemed to swoop back from her curvy frame, as if she'd turned around very suddenly to look at the person taking the picture. Her lips were curled upwards in a smile that just barely showed off her pearly white teeth. Over the top half of her face, she wore what appeared to be some strange form of opera mask, or something of the like. It was impossible to tell the colour, as the photo was black and white, but if he had to guess, he would say it was silver, or bone white, from how it appeared in the image. It covered her eyes and most of her nose as well as her forehead. Her raven black hair cascaded down her shoulders, pulled backwards by the feather-like protrusions of the mask completely ceased listening to what Amy was saying, and walked towards the photograph. As if in a daze, he stood before it and stared up at her. To him, she was quite possibly the most beautiful woman he had seen in his entire life. A small white card, like you might see in an art museum, 
was situated at the left corner of the photograph. It read, Helena ascending the staircase. Artist unknown. Model unknown. 1976. A lot of people take notice of that, the landlady said. Her voice snapped Max out of his trance, and he turned toward her and gave a weak smile. He felt oddly embarrassed, as if someone had just called attention to him checking a woman out in public. He supposed, in a way, he had been. Running his fingers through his shoulder-length greying hair, he did his best to appear nonchalant. It's very striking. Who took it? he asked. The landlady shrugged and pointed toward the little white card beside it. No clue. No one does. Been here as long as the building has. Before it was apartments, even. What was it before then? Max asked, but all he got was another shrug. Amy, the landlady, averted her eyes and muttered that she couldn't say for sure. She didn't sound entirely convincing in her denial. Max turned back to look up at the photograph. The model's smile was captivating, and somehow, despite the fact her eyes weren't visible, he felt as if he could feel her gaze on him. Not in an unwelcome way, in a playful, impish sort of way. He imagined what her eyes might look like behind the mask. Dark brown, perhaps, or dazzling icy blue, perhaps a sparkling sea green. Looking out at him from across the years, that playful and mysterious smile, seeming to say, follow me, as she ascended the staircase. You kept it all this time, he asked. Amy, the landlady, grunted in reply. Could never seem to get rid of it. If Max had been paying closer attention to her words, he might have noticed something about the way she said this. He might have caught something in her tone that would have given him pause, or made him want to ask more questions. As it was, there was only one question on his mind right now. How much did you say the rent was? And so Max moved into his new apartment. The rent was very affordable. He had a decent, albeit part-time job that covered it, with a little left over for what he needed to get by when it came to food and other necessities. In his more lucid moments in those first few weeks, he told himself that it was ridiculous that he'd chosen this place for such a frivolous reason. He knew for sure that if he shared with any of his friends or family why he'd pick this apartment building over others that were better in terms of quality or location, they would laugh at him. And yet, each day when he headed out to work, he would cast one last look at her photograph, at Helena ascending the staircase. And each evening when he returned home, he'd be greeted by the sight of her. And no matter how tiring his day, and no matter how thankless and joyless his shift had felt, he would feel himself moved when the sight of her greeted him. He even began to whisper a little greeting to the photograph and say goodbye to it as he left though only when he was alone. Though in truth, he didn't feel alone, even when no one else was coming or going down the stairs. It felt like she was there with him. Helena. Such a beautiful name. In his free time, he tried to learn who she'd been. He didn't have a great deal to go on, but he had a little. He tried looking up models of the 70s who had gone by the first name Helena. When his search proved fruitless, he began looking at photographers of the 70s and looking through their work, desperate to catch a glimpse of her in another photograph, one that would provide him with a last name and a way to learn more about her. Desperate to find anything that might give him more information about this woman he felt so strangely allured by. He didn't become a shut-in or an obsessive. At least, he didn't think so. He still went out, still did normal things, spent time with friends and co-workers, went to his job. He even made an effort to get to know some of the people in the building. Only two really gave him much in the way of the time of day, though. An older man named Joseph, who, depending on what mood you caught him in, could either be somewhat pleasant company or a surly son of a bitch. And a woman, a few years younger, named Diane, who he found to be good company when they wound up passing the time together. It was Diane who first noticed the way he looked at the photograph. The two of them were walking down the stairs as he made his way off to work, 
but he couldn't stop himself from casting one last lingering look back at her. Back at Helena. And he must have been staring for longer than he realized, because soon Diane was nudging him in the ribs. You like her, don't you? She said in a teasing tone of voice. Despite being nearly the same age as him, she sounded more like a kid on the schoolyard teasing their friend about their first adolescent crush than a grown woman. And he found himself blushing bright red, just as immaturely. What? I was just, just looking at the... He stammered lamely. His cheeks felt hot, and he fidgeted uncomfortably upon the staircase. Diane grinned like the Cheshire cat itself as she leaned forward. Is she your girlfriend? She asked, her tone only becoming more playful and mischievous. He tried to laugh it off, but it was clear that she wasn't going to let it drop. She giggled at his obvious embarrassment, and as he began to mumble his way through some excuse for his fascinated gaze, she elbowed him in the side once more. I'm just fucking with you, Max. I ain't gonna judge you. Truth is, we all get like that, she said. You all get like what? Max asked, his embarrassment giving way to inquisitiveness. Diane pointed at the photograph and smiled a little wistfully. We all get a little gaga over her. I doubt there's anyone in this building who doesn't have a little bit of a crush on Helena. God knows I do, she explained. Max nodded, feeling a little less humiliated now, but at the same time, he also felt even more curious about the subject of the strangely captivating photograph that hung there upon the wall. Do you know who she is, or was? Did she live here? he asked. Diane shook her head and turned to begin walking back down the stairs. No idea, man. The photo was here when I moved in. The only person who knows is Amy, maybe, or one of the older types who've been here longer. Max nodded, and with one last look at Helena, he made his way down the stairs after Diane. He knew it was ridiculous, but as he looked up at the photograph, he couldn't shake the feeling that Helena was listening to them somehow, that she was listening in on them talking about her, which was a ridiculous thing to think. And the next thought that occurred to him was even more ludicrous. The reason he felt like this was the case was because, to his eyes, it looked as if Helena had moved, as if her pose was slightly different, her head cocked to the side, her body closer to the frame. Had she been standing on the seventh step or the sixth the last time he looked at the photo? Had her hand rested on her hip like that? And her smile looked different. Her smile no longer looked playful, but he couldn't put his finger on what it was that had changed. He dismissed all of this from his mind as soon as he was outside in the fresh air. Photographs didn't spring to life. Whoever Helena had been, she was either someone out there in the world living her own life, or else dead and buried. Either way, she certainly wasn't listening in on people's conversations through a photograph she'd posed for decades ago. It was a few nights later that he had the dream. He was in the building, but not in the building. It wasn't an apartment building anymore, it was a hotel, and he was one of many people, many guests swarming around the lobby. Idle chit-chat filled the air. Around him, people dressed smartly in expensive-looking suits, laughing and joking amongst each other, or bantering back and forth. He walked through it all like a ghost. Occasionally, people would tip their hat to him, or offer a warm handshake. He would reply with words his ears didn't seem to comprehend. It was as if their voices and his were coming from very far away. But he could see just fine, and his eyes locked upon the staircase and the woman upon them. Helena. The name passed his lips. This time he heard himself say it. And impossibly, she seemed to hear it too. She looked down at him, with half her face hidden behind the elegant silver mask she wore. It was impossible to fully gauge her emotions in that moment. But she smiled down at him. Those pearly white teeth seemed to sparkle as she offered him a dazzling grin. And then she spoke. Follow me. And she stepped through the doors in front of her as he followed behind. Followed her up the stairs. And woke 
Max glared at his alarm clock as it buzzed harshly at him. He'd never felt a more intense and acute hatred for an inanimate object than he felt at that moment. Slamming his hand down on the snooze button with more force than was called for, he curled up and rested his head against the pillow, and desperately tried to drift off once more. His attempts would be for nothing, however. Sleep did not come. The rest of that week, and most of the one after, his sleep was dreamless for the most part or if dreams did come to him, they were unconnected to Helena. He began to actively resent his imagination. Why could he not dream about her again? He felt like someone who'd seen the start of a film, only for the reel to combust ten minutes in, denying him any chance to see what happened next. What happened when he followed Helena up the staircase? He mentioned it in passing to Diane one day, when they were having coffee. He'd almost meant it as a joke, really. She teased him about how things with Helena were. She would frequently make snarky little remarks about he was oh, in love with a photograph, though never in a cruel way. It was the gentle teasing of a friend poking a little fun at another's strangeness, and asked him if she could be jealous that you're trying to steal my girl. He said, in reply, Maybe you're just not committed enough. I mean, do you dream about her? Or something like that. Diane went white as a sheet. What kind of dreams? She asked. He'd laugh the question off. Get your mind out of the gutter, he said, thinking that she was implying something dirty. But her expression had changed. She didn't look like she was playing around anymore. No, dude. Seriously. What kind of dreams? So, he told her. And when he told her, she'd look more and more fearful with every word. He couldn't understand why what he was saying seemed to be upsetting her like this. Max, you're not fucking with me here, right? She asked him. He shook his head and assured her he most definitely was not. And asked her why she looked so freaked out by what he'd shared with her. Her hands cupped her coffee mug tightly, and she looked down at the table for a few moments. Finally, she looked back up at him and made him promise to listen to what she said and to believe that she wasn't making this up. He nodded and promised her this. I've had that dream, and so have a bunch of other people. Despite his promise, Max's immediate reaction was, You're kidding. But if Diane was pulling his leg, she certainly had a better poker face than he would have given her credit for. Listen, I know like four other people in the building who've had that dream. Well, five if you count me. How do you know? He asked. Diane rolled her eyes. Just because you only speak to like all of one person in the whole building doesn't mean the rest of us do. I have got other friends beside you, Max, she said. He nodded and apologized. And your friends in the building, they've had the same dream? The exact same dream? He asked. She nodded. And that's not the really damaged part. Like, you say something woke you up? She asked. He nodded again. <sighs> that's probably for the best. The dream gets way, way more screwy after that. Like, I don't know about Joseph and the others, but I stopped sleeping for a while. Took pills and everything. Got maybe two or three hours a night and tried to avoid having that dream again. Why? What's so bad about it? Max asked. Diane didn't answer him exactly. Her mood seemed to have changed drastically. She mumbled about how it had gotten weird and asked if they could just drop the subject, which Max reluctantly agreed to. But while he chose not to press Diane on the topic, he was far from done thinking about it. He dreamt of Helena again that night. The dream began the same as the previous one had. But this time, he didn't wake as he began to ascend the staircase. He could see her, a few feet in front of him, her back to him as she walked through the large doors and into the darkened room beyond. And he became aware that a strange hush had fallen over the room. He turned back to see that all the other guests in the hotel lobby had ceased their casual conversation and were now looking up at him, gleaming 
expectant eyes all peering at him as he climbed the staircase after Helena. Two dozen people or more, all watching him as if anticipating something. He turned back to see Helena looking back at him from within the room. She grinned widely and beckoned to him with one finger. Don't keep me waiting. He woke with a start, sweaty and panting. His heart was hammering in his chest, and he felt ill at ease. He felt frightened, and he didn't know why. That was the fact of the matter. And he felt like he desperately wanted to get out of his small apartment. Pulling on pants, a clean shirt and shoes, he headed out the door and made his way down the hall. He paused as he realized what this would mean. It would mean walking past Helena. And for the first time since he'd moved here, that thought didn't fill him with joy, but rather a strange apprehension. Still, he made his way down the stairs and looked up at the photograph. Helena stood as she ever did, posed with one foot on one stair and another foot on the other. Her enigmatic Mona Lisa-like smile, the glinting mask she wore, but something was off. One of her hands was held out toward whoever was taking the photograph. One finger bent towards her in a beckoning motion. She hadn't been posed like that before. He was certain of it. He stared at this photograph day in, day out for the past few months, and he knew damn well what the thing looked like. Well enough to see that it had changed. It can't have changed, he muttered to himself. He rubbed his tired eyes and looked up at the photograph. It was still different from the one he'd seen only that very afternoon. He began to reach out a hand towards the frame. His fingers were less than an inch from the glass, when the creak of one of the stairs made him pull his hand back, like a child caught sneaking cookies that his parents had told him weren't for him. His head whipped around to the right, where the creak had come from, and he saw, stood at the top of the stairs, the familiar form of Diane. She looked down at him. She looked sweaty and out of breath, as if she'd been running a marathon, and she shook her head. Don't do it, Max. She turned and headed back the way she'd come from. He followed close behind, putting a hand on her shoulder to stop her as he quietly called out to her, aware of the lateness of the hour and not wanting to wake anyone else. Diane, he hissed, and she turned around. Her normally friendly features looked far less cheerful right now. Diane, did you... He began, but trailed off, realizing how ridiculous what he was about to ask really was. Diane cocked her head to the side and looked irritable. Just go back to bed, Max, she told him. Did you dream about it tonight? He asked. Her expression answered his question for him. You need to leave this alone, Max. It's not healthy, Diane said, and his grip on her shoulder tightened as he took a few steps closer. What does that mean? Unhealthy how? He asked her. Let go of me, she hissed, and he realized for the first time just how tightly he was gripping her shoulder. He released his grip and pulled back, shocked at his own behavior. He began to mutter an apology, but Diane just gestured dismissively at him. I told you, everyone falls for Helena, but some people get weird about it. Don't get weird on me, Max. You seem like a good guy. She turned and walked away, leaving him standing in the gloom. As he passed the photograph on his way back to his apartment, he looked up at it. Helena's outstretched hand was now back where it had been before, upon her hip. He wondered if it had ever changed at all. Maybe he needed more sleep, he told himself. Maybe he was seeing things. He'd heard that could happen when you were very tired or had just woken up, like your brain was still playing tricks on you. He returned to his apartment and chose not to turn around when he heard the stairs behind him creak softly. Diane's words gnawed at him over the next few days, and he turned the focus of his research away from the photograph and its mysterious model directly, and instead... He began to do research about the building itself. He was not altogether surprised to learn that it had once been a hotel, but 
but his rational mind told him that the fact his dream had gotten that part right must be meaningless. He probably heard the landlady, or Diane or Joseph, mentioning it in passing. Or his brain had put two and two together on its own. After all, the entrance to the building looked so much like an old hotel lobby, it hardly took a detective genius to guess that this had been what the building had originally been used for. Nothing stood out in his research as particularly alarming or morbid. The hotel had simply closed its doors in the 80s, another victim of Reaganomics. No mentions of any scandal or sinister goings-on, and no mention of the parties like the one in his dream. The hotel hadn't been in an especially wealthy part of the city after all, so the chances of a party like the one in his dream happening were low. He looked through what old black and white photographs of the place he could find, and one in particular caught his eye. It was four men, all dressed very smartly and apparently absorbed in conversation. But it wasn't the faces or the manner they were dressed in that drew his eye. It was what one of them was holding. He was holding a camera. He told himself that it was ridiculous to make the leap his brain was making right now. But all the same, he scrolled through the article, desperate to see if there was some caption that mentioned the man's name any of the men's names. They didn't, however. They simply talked about the history of the place, and the few photographs that were scattered throughout the article lacked anything in the way of real information. There was something else about the photograph that seemed off. Something that was itching at the back of his brain. But he couldn't think what it was. He dreamt that night of Helena. Helena ascending the staircase. This time the dream was different. This time the chatter of the party goers around him didn't sound like the meaningless babble of drunk playboys. He still couldn't hear what they were saying clearly, but something about the snippets that he made out made him feel horribly anxious. It was as if his brain was screaming at him to get out of here, to run. What were they saying? Why did it make his skin crawl like this? If he could only concentrate on their words... But that, of course, was not how dreams worked. Instead, just as before, he began to climb the stairs. Just as before, the room fell into a kind of awed hush. Just as before, he looked back at the room to see those eyes peering up at him. Predatory was the word that came to mind. Predatory and cruel. He began to follow Helena into the room beyond the red doors. A chandelier hung from the ceiling, and as Helena twirled her way back into the room, he became aware of soft music playing. Someone was sat on an old piano, playing an accompaniment to it. Helena's laughter came from just a little further into the room. Soft, girlish laughter, warm and welcoming. How could he be afraid when Helena was here with him? How could anything be wrong? How could anything else matter? Max followed her into the room. And he woke with a start. Grumbling, he rolled over in the bed and wiped the sleep from his eyes. He gazed at the alarm clock by the bed that told him it was four in the morning. He was about to try and get a couple more hours sleep before he noticed it. The strange smell in the room. It was sweet and fragrant and unmistakably the smell of perfume. A woman's perfume. Max went from room to room of his small apartment. There were hardly a lot of places to search. He even found himself checking the cupboards and under the bed and chided himself for it. He felt ridiculous. What was he going to do next? See if the bogeyman was hiding in the shadows as well. But he couldn't stop himself. He had to be sure. And when he confirmed that he was alone... He lay back down in bed and tried to tell himself that he was imagining the smell, or that there was some other explanation for it, that he was coming through the air vents from somewhere else in the building. Yeah, that must be it, he told himself. It was the most logical and sensible answer. He couldn't fall back to sleep. It was after work that day when it happened. He made his way up the familiar staircase, looking up at that smiling figure, what was that look on her face? Excitement? Simple happiness? Anticipation? No, it felt like something else. 
Who were you, Helena? He muttered to himself. He was halfway to his apartment when it clicked into place. The thing that had been nagging at him for a little while now. The thing that had been buzzing away in the back of his brain since he'd first found those old photographs of the place when it had been a hotel. Desperately, he searched for the web page he'd seen the pictures on. After a few minutes of searching, he found it and scrolled through until he found the one that his brain had been screaming at him to pay attention to. It was so obvious that he couldn't believe it had taken him this long to realize it. What had been staring him in the face all this time. The picture showed the building's entrance hall when it had been a hotel lobby. It was more or less the same, minus some of the more expensive looking furnishings and the things that were no longer needed now the purpose of the building had changed. More or less the same. Until you came to the staircase. Because at the top of the stairs, where they branched off to the left and the right, there was no photograph of Helena. In fact, there was no wall there at all. It was a massive pair of sturdy-looking doors, and if he had to place money on what colour they were, he'd put a substantial bet on them being red. It took him a while to get the chance to speak to Amy, the landlady. She avoided the tenants as best she could, mainly because the apartments in the building had no shortage of problems, and she had little to no intention of fixing them. Still, when he managed to get a minute of her time, and with the reassurance that he didn't want to complain about something, she agreed to speak with him. I'll make it quick, understand? I'm a busy woman. He assured her that he would, and asked her if he could talk to her about the building's history. Amy arched an eyebrow and looked at him a little more suspiciously at that. Why? What's it to you? She asked him. It used to be a hotel, right? Back in the 60s and 70s? He asked, ignoring her own question. She nodded and looked away. Yeah, place closed down in 77, or 76, can't remember which, she told him. He cocked his head to the side. That didn't match what he'd read. I heard it closed in the 80s. Officially, sure, but they weren't getting visitors long before that, on account of what happened. As soon as she said it, she seemed to regret it. She stood up abruptly and announced that she needed to go, that she had things to do. Max stood up as well and began to follow her as she tried to excuse herself. What happened? I didn't read anything about... He began, and Amy waved his concerns away. Oh, you wouldn't have. Not in the papers or nothing, but people knew sure enough what happened. Something like that. Word gets around. People talk. So what happened here? Was someone hurt? Kill? She shook her head. Ain't allowed to not tell you if that happened, right? Far as I know, no one died here, she said. There was something about the way she said it. The pause before she said died. Like she had to think about it, or like she was being very careful about how she chose her words. Max looked at her suspiciously as she quickened her pace, and he did likewise to keep up with her. But something happened, right? Something bad happened here, in this building. A lot of bad things happened here, probably. The kind of people used to come here, Amy said, then cursed under her breath. It was obvious she wanted this conversation to end, just as obvious that she hadn't meant to say that. The two of them were halfway down the stairs when Max pointed up at the photograph and asked the question. The question that he needed to ask. It had something to do with her, right? With Helena? Amy froze. Her body looked as if it had gone stiff as a board. Her hands balled into fists and then unclenched and then balled up into fists again. Max decided to press his luck. What did he have to lose? There used to be a room here, behind this photograph. Or well, there still is, I guess. Why is it covered up? What happened in there? Why? But before he could finish another word, Amy rounded on him and unleashed a tirade upon him that brought several people out of their apartments to watch. In a loud and booming voice that he wouldn't have guessed she possessed, 
She made it clear to him that she wasn't here to answer questions, that she didn't take kindly to nosy people who couldn't take a hint, that she didn't like people poking and prying into things that didn't concern them, and that she didn't like the way he was speaking about her building. So, if you've got a problem with this place, you can move your shit out and find better accommodations. You hear me? I don't want trouble. I don't want drama. I run a nice, quiet, respectable building and I won't have people like you ruining it. You hear me? You goddamn listening to me, friend? She spat at him. Max backed away in shock. Amy could certainly be gruff and no one would ever award her Landlady of the Year. But the sheer venom in her voice and the look of rage in her eyes and on her face was something he never would have expected from her. He just nodded dumbly. As she turned to leave, he heard her mutter something. It sounded like, always the goddamn same. But he couldn't be sure. He was about to head back to his apartment when a voice made him stop. The familiar voice of Joseph. The old man stood on the stairs, looking up at him. You should leave well enough alone, Maxie. No one wants all that being dredged up again, he said. His tone wasn't angry or fearful like Amy's had been, and it certainly didn't sound like he was threatening him. In fact, if Max had to put a word to it, he'd say the old man sounded sad. Sad and tired, as if simply saying the words had drained something out of him. He took a few steps down the stairs towards Joseph, and looked up at the photo, and then back to him. All of what? What happened here? he asked, his tone insistent, even demanding. Joseph shook his head and sighed. Bad business. Bad people. The worst kind of people. All dead and buried now, and good riddance to the lot of them, I say, he muttered. What do you mean, bad people? Was this back when this place was a hotel? Max asked. The old man looked uncertain of what to say. He looked nervous and unsure of himself, a far cry from how he normally was when Max had spoken to him in the past. He knew Joseph as a grouchy sort, with a warm heart buried under there somewhere, but the man in front of him now looked far less sure of himself. Sure, bad people, dangerous people, used to stay here back then, people mixed up in unsavory business. How do you know all of this? Max asked. Joseph snorted at him, as if he was being especially dense and foolish. I was there, kid, he said. Max looked at him disbelievingly. Joseph seemed to comprehend the emotions playing behind Max's eyes and nodded, his weary face offering Max a smile. Yeah, I really am as old as I look, he chuckled. Max shook his head, worried that he'd offended the man. And that was the last thing he wanted to do because he'd enjoyed Joseph's company in the months since he'd moved in, and because he wanted to hear more. No, I didn't mean that. It's just, you never mentioned. I assumed you'd never been here before this place became apartments, he said. Assume makes an ass out of me and you, Maxie. Yep, yeah, I was there. Back when they... Back when it all happened, he said. Max finished descending the stairs. The two of them now stood facing each other underneath the gaze of Helena. Max felt like he was back in church. He remembered the tight, uncomfortable feeling he would get when he entered the confessional, or when he stood under the gaze of Jesus up on the cross. He deliberately didn't turn to look up at the photograph of Helena. He felt strangely certain that he didn't want to see it right now. When what happened? Look, who used to come here? What happened here? He asked, his voice getting louder and louder. The tenants who had returned to their apartments once more were poking their heads out from behind their doors. He was drawing a crowd, and he didn't care. Joseph fidgeted awkwardly in front of him and shook his head. I didn't have nothing to do with that. I wasn't like them. I wasn't. I didn't have nothing to do with that bad business. I just... I just took pictures. Joseph turned and began to hurriedly make his way up the stairs. His words sunk in. Max looked up at the photograph of Helena. Her lips seemed to have curled further back. Her smile looked wider. Wider and less friendly. Less kind. 
He looked at the card beside the photograph. Artist unknown. And he thought about another photograph. A photograph of a sharp-dressed, dark-haired man holding a camera. He imagined that man older. A good few decades older. But still, unmistakably, the same man. He watched as Joseph made his way unhurriedly back towards his apartment, and he began to call out to him, began to follow him. But he'd shut and locked the door by the time Max made it down the hallway, and no amount of banging upon it would make him open up. He missed work that day. He went to the library instead and looked through as many old newspapers as he could get his hands on. Flipping through the old and yellowing pages, he looked for anything to do with the building but his search was as fruitless as his earlier one on the internet had been. There was nothing, not a single scrap of useful information. It was as he was angrily flipping through the 10th or maybe even 15th newspaper that it happened, that a single old and crinkled piece of paper fluttered out onto the floor from between the pages. At first he thought he'd rip the paper by accident, and as he sheepishly bent down to retrieve the page, he prepared himself to apologize to the librarian. But the piece of paper was not from the newspaper at all. It was something someone had tucked between the pages like a bookmark. Though, this was no bookmark either. It was a sheet of paper with the words missing printed on it. It was short on details, just a phone number to call if you could help, and a name and an address. The name was Helena Chandler and the photograph of her was the second that Max had seen. He slept uneasily that night, he tossed and turned in his bed, and the dream came to him again. This time he could hear the music filling the hotel lobby as the guests chatted around him. This time he could hear what they were saying, every sickening word, every vile syllable, and he knew that he should feel nauseated, repulsed, angry even, he knew he should take the glass in his hand and smash it against the nearest cranium. And yet instead, he shook hands and laughed and bantered with them as he made his way through the room, toward the staircase, toward Helena. Darling, what have you got for us tonight? He called out to her. His voice wasn't his own. It was a deep, rich rumble, a commanding voice, an aristocratic voice. The voice of someone who had been to far more expensive schools and had far more expensive tastes than Max could ever have dreamed of. Helena looked down at him and smiled. Come and see. As she ascended the staircase, he followed her through the red doors. The chandelier dangled from the ceiling. Along the walls, the various mirrors reflected the room back on itself. The floor tiles were mirrored as well. The music grew louder. Helena was twirling and dancing ahead of him. Helena. His Helena. All he had to do was give himself to her. The man at the piano was playing faster. White keys were turning to red. The partygoers were laughing. He was laughing. Or was he crying? Somewhere behind him, someone took a photograph. He woke with a strangled scream. It died in his throat, and he clamped his hand across his mouth, not wanting to wake the people in the apartments next to his. His room smelt strange and sweet, and almost sickly. And he knew what he had to do. He crept down the stairs. No one was awake at this hour, he was sure. He crept down the stairs and looked up at the photograph of Helena. His hands, slick with sweat, took as firm a grip as he could of the frame. Gently, he pulled the photo off the wall and placed it gingerly against the stairs to his left. All that remained now was that hideous wallpaper. Slowly and surely, he began to claw at it, dig his nails into it and rip it strip after strip away, revealing what lay behind it. What did he always told himself? The landlady of this place was cheap, far too cheap to brick anything over, if there was a quicker, less expensive solution. And behind that garish wallpaper was a pair of large red doors. The paint was old and worn and chipped. 
They looked far less majestic than the ones in his dream, but they were still clearly one and the same. He pushed gently on them, and they swung inwards as if they'd been waiting for him, waiting for his touch, an invitation, a summoning. The room inside smelt musty and hot. If he could be said to have an odour, this would be it. The smell of a room that had once had a large number of bodies inside, generating heat and sweat and rage and fear and pain. He stepped inside. The chandelier was covered in cobwebs. Likewise, the piano had a coating of filth and grime upon it. Some of the mirrors upon the walls and the floor had become cracked, and as he stepped into the room, he heard the glass splinter further beneath his shoes. He didn't concern himself with the noise. He didn't concern himself with anything. He'd put on his best suit, the one he wore for work. It still felt shabby and cheap in these surroundings. If he strained his ears, he could hear music, music and chatter, the occasional burst of laughter. He was alone in the room. Behind him, the stairs creaked. Someone was coming up the stairs. He turned and smiled. Elena was ascending the staircase. She was dressed in a long, flowing black and violet gown. The silver mask over her eyes was extravagant and beautiful, a sight to behold. She was impossible, impossibly perfect, impossibly flawless, forever. You came to me, she said. Her voice was soft and gentle like a caress, but he could hear it just fine. It was as if, though a little more than a whisper, it carried straight through to his brain. The music swelled. She entered the room, took him in her arms. The two began to move confidently across the mirrored floor. Max had never danced before, not like this, but the steps seemed known to him. It felt the most natural thing in the world. Helena's hand on his waist. His face reflected in the mask she wore, the smile on her lips, those teeth, those pearly white pointed teeth. He could feel eyes on them. The laughter had faded, the music had grown louder, louder and louder. Would it wake the whole building? He didn't care. Here he was with his Helena. Her hands moved to slowly slip the silver mask off her face. Her eye sockets were ringed with jagged little points, sharp, barbed, thorn-like protrusions. If Max had gotten the chance, he may have screamed, he may have called for help, he may have done a great many things. Helena pressed her face to his. Everything went red and then black. Jets of thick, dark red coated the dusty mirrored floor beneath the two of them, as they danced and twirled across it. His body shook once, and then twice in Helena's embrace. A sound like someone sucking a clam or an oyster out of its shell filled the room, mixed with a wet gurgling sound from the back of Max's throat. His clean white shirt was red. His pale white pants were red. So was the floor around him. If he'd paid more attention, he might have seen that the walls and floor had many such marks. The occasional handprint or dried puddle. Helena let out a deep moan of satisfaction. She held Max in her arms as she danced with what was left of him. There was a soft chewing sound coming from the thorny fangs that filled her eye sockets. And gently, she slid her silver mask back down across them. The laughter wasn't laughter. It was sobbing. There was no answer when Diane knocked on Max's door the next day. She'd wanted to invite him to a little get-together she was having at her apartment. Giving up on it, she decided to head back there and write down a quick note to slip under his door. She was almost all the way up the stairs that led to her place when it caught her eye. Helena ascending the staircase. And there, just a few stairs below her, was a man. His back was to the camera. You couldn't see his face. 
She stared at the picture and felt tears wetting her eyes. From somewhere nearby, she could almost hear what sounded like music. So what did you think of that one? Tell me you loved it. Go on, please, 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 because I thought that one was super extra special. Um, got me right from the beginning, and it was a sheer delight to read. Wasn't quite sure what was going to happen, but I did have a fairly good idea where it was going, but still very, very satisfying in the end, anyway. So, thoughts, feelings, comments, love <laughs> in the comment section below the video, and I will do my best to reply as best I can. You know, still in the early weeks of being here in the Netherlands and things are quite hectic, but loving it and I've got a bit more time on my hands to do some recording, so you might have noticed there are some longer stories coming in over the last few weeks. All good, yeah? Hope so. Well, I will see you again very soon, my dear friends. But until then, sweet dreams and bye-bye. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook, come chat with me on Twitter, listen to the background music and download it if you like on SoundCloud, drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt, and, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now, looking forward to seeing you all again real soon, so... Come check me out, okay?